it won't upload or whatnot. So let me minimize this. Let's see if this works. It'll either work or it won't. I'm not sure if it'll let you screen share twice. Um, but we'll see. Either will or it won't. Okay, I think it's working. Uh, I don't know about audio, but let's see. Um, yeah, all right, we'll give it a shot, see if it works. Yeah, what's been happening here recently is I'll upload my videos to Ensemble, but they don't really upload, and so I have to sit here and wait for them to download after class. It's getting a little, a little weird. I'm going to download it, but I'm going to see how the recording shows up on Teams. We'll see how it works. Um, I know I said I was going to try and get your exams graded by today, but there are a lot of them. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't uh, finished that. I've, I've started to go through them. Uh, they're not, I don't see anything that's like, you know, incredibly alarming, like, oh, goodness, no. Uh, everybody's doing pretty much as expected. So um, my goal is to get those back to you by Thursday. Um, homework 4.1 is being graded. 4.2 is due today. Um, let's talk about the schedule moving forward, okay? So what we're going to do is today, and uh, today and Thursday is going to be our uh, culminative lectures uh, associated with bending stresses. Today, we're going to focus on uh, uh, homogeneous beams or beams of a single material. Uh, and then on Thursday, we'll talk about beams of two materials. We'll talk about composite beams. Um, I like these two lectures. I mean, there. Uh, let me say this. Uh, there are some applications in this course that are more applicable to one discipline than another. So, for example, when we did power torque relationships, that was much more applicable to the mechanicals in the room. And I would say that composite beams are probably more applicable to the civil engineers in the room. But I do like covering it, uh, even for those of you that aren't civil engineers. Um, for one, you still may experience it in your uh, in your field, but two, it really serves to reinforce bending theory. If you understand composite beams, you get it, okay, because there's a lot of stuff that goes into there. On Tuesday, what we're going to do is we're going to do transverse shear stress, um, and uh, that's going to be our last lecture. My plan on Thursday before break is to do a discussion on beam deflections, uh, and that'll, that'll be it between now and, and, and spring break. So with that, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, I want to go ahead and tell you uh, in the onset that we're going to be talking about stresses and beams. And I want This is a weird slide to pay attention to, but I want to show you something real quick. So we've got stresses and beams, and see where it says deriving the expression? Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a few slides to kind of show you what's going on. Um, there's going to be a second section of the presentation which says using the expression. Okay, So I'm going to talk about the derivation first, and then we'll talk about using it. So I don't want you to um, think that this is all just going to be one big derivation lecture, because it's not. We're going to uh, roll up our sleeves and, and, and um, get our hands dirty, uh, as it were, uh, a little bit later in the lecture. But I do want you to understand the, the, the expression. I mean, we are ultimately going to arrive at one of the most fundamental equations in all of engineering mechanics, which is sigma equals my over i. Okay? And, and I would argue that what today is doing is really piecing together what we've been talking about for the last couple of lectures. So, for example, um, on la last Tuesday, what we did is we spent the entire lecture talking about I, right? I was the moment of inertia. We discussed the algorithm for computing the moment of inertia. We had examples uh, in class on doing it. We had homework problems. I mean, that's really all the homework was about, was the moment of inertia. A and also locating the centroid, which is a necessary tethering to that. But that's basically all that we talked about. And then on Thursday, all we talked about was M, which was the bending moment, right? Shear diagrams, moment diagrams. We could obtain our internal bending moment from the, um, uh, uh, from the shear and moment diagram. That's what the, shear and mo that's what the moment diagram is. It is a plot of the internal moment response in a beam uh, along its span. And so sigma equals my over i is going to be the stress formula. That's going to be how we determine stresses uh, subject, uh, w w uh, with elements that are subject to bending, okay? So, or flexure. So if you ever hear me use the term flexure, flexure and bending uh, are the same thing. Um, the reason that we're talking about this is because I have said this before, 
but now I'm sort of stating it a little bit formally. So beams or flexural elements are among the most fundamental elements in engineering, period. I don't care what you're designing, civil engineering structure, mechanical engineering system, I don't care. Just about any engineering system that has forces subjected to it, has something in it that's being bent in one way or another. It, it, I mean, just about every system that, I, that you can think of. Understanding how to compute stresses and beams is critical to engineering, period. Okay. Now, I want to make a point here. Beams experience both shears and moments, right? So as a result, they experience shear stress and bending stress. Okay. So this week, we're going to be talking about bending stress. And on Tuesday, we're going to be talking about shears, okay? about the shearing stress that results from uh, 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 the shear load on a beam. But we'll get to it. Now, I want to frame my discussion going back to equilibrium, okay? So, I have a beam or some structure that's subjected to a series of loads, and I break out my secret weapon of structural engineering, which is the samurai sword or the lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, and I cut a section. Going back to my introductory example when I first started talking about this, if I'm sitting here on this table, right here on this end of the table, if somebody comes up to me with their samurai sword or lightsaber and they cut through this part of the table, what happens to me? I fall down, right? We all know what happens to your grade as a result. It was a joke, all right? But the reason why is because inside the meme, inside the, the structure here, there are internal forces keeping me upright, okay? And looking at it from a statics perspective, three equations, three unknowns, I propose there are at most three unknown forces inside the system. If, if we're restricting our discussion to 2D. So there's an unknown force in the x direction, which considering our orientation is an axial force, a force along the length of the, uh, the beam. There is a vertical force, which is presenting itself as a transverse shear. And then there is an unknown internal bending moment. Now here's the thing. We've already dealt with one of these. We've already done that in this course. What is the stress from this force P? Like, how do I compute the sigma for P? Sigma equals what? If I have an axial stress in a bar, how do I compute the stress? P over A, right? Is the coffee, is that what it is? Got to get the caffeine kicked in whatnot. But I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. So we already know that axial forces generate normal stresses, and we already know how to compute those. We know that under this axial force P, we generate an internal axial stress, which is P over A. We already know that, right? That's not, hopefully, confusing. Everybody with me so far on that? Now, what about the other two? What about the shear and the moment? Well, I propose that the shear and moment generate stresses as well. Now, the shears, we're going to handle these later. But today, I want to determine this. Now, spoiler alert, I think we all know what this formula is going to be. It's going to be sigma equals my over i. But why? Why that formula? Okay. Well, today, I want to discuss that formula. Okay. And I want to discuss where it comes from. So, in order to do that, I do a little bit of a derivation. Now, I'll tell you point blank. I do this derivation a little bit differently than the textbook does, but the reason I do it this way is, one, I don't like to um, mix up bending stresses and beam deflections. I want to take those one at a time. And two, I tend to like this way of deriving it because it utilizes notation that's pretty fresh in our heads right now from our centroid discussions and whatnot. Okay. Now, whenever you're in engineering mechanics land and you start getting into the practice of making derivations, you have to start making some assumptions. Okay, So some of the assumptions that we're going to make are as follows. So number one, we're going to assume linear and elastic behavior. So we're going to assume that the stress and strain are proportional to one another. And to be fair, that's going to matter more um, when we start talking about composite beams. It's not going to matter as much today. Um, and the remaining two uh, assumptions are going to matter more when we start talking about beam deflections. Um, so the first thing that we're going to discuss is, or the, that we're going to assume is strain compatibility. And that's just another way 
of saying that all of the deformations are linearly proportional to one another. Um, so we don't have these bizarre kinks in the beam that when we take the beam and deflect it that we have a, a smooth deflected surface. And we also are going to assume what are called small deflections or what's called first order behavior. That is not going to uh, present a problem in this class. It can present a little bit of a problem in more advanced engineering applications. The best way of describing uh, first order versus second order behavior is to paint a simple example to you. So let's say that I am a hiker, okay, and I'm hiking through the, the woods and whatnot, and I find myself on top of a hill, on the apex of a hill. And there's a guy with me, and he's kind of a jerk, and he decides to shove me, right? So I'm on top of this hill, and he shoves me. I can probably, you know, maybe, I don't know, catch myself and hopefully not fall down, but it becomes much more difficult to maintain my equilibrium if he shoves me and I'm wearing an 80 pound backpack, okay? Because what happens is I'm wearing this backpack and I get shoved, okay? What happens is as I get shoved, now the backpack is off my neutral axis, right? And so because there's an eccentricity, that generates some moment, which generates some more deflection, which generates more moment, which generates more deflection. See how it kind of builds on itself, how you get that more moment equals more deflection, more deflection equals more moment, and it sort of builds on itself. That's what we call a second order effect, okay? And, that, and another uh, term that's used for that phenomenon is large deflection theory. And so large deflection theory has specific uh, areas where you need to consider it. So like in earthquake engineering, you have to consider large deflection theory and whatnot. Uh, but for the vast majority of engineering applications, we don't need to consider that because, I mean, think, if I'm designing this floor system, right, that's holding up this roof, I'm not expecting it to deflect like three feet. We're talking about, you know, small deflections. We are, in fact, sizing the system so that doesn't happen, okay? So we can sort of uh, avoid a lot of that stuff. All right. Now, let's lay out the problem. So let's say I have a beam uh, and it's subjected to a series of uh, point loads. You know, I've got this, distributed load, whatever. Uh, I'll, whatever loads are on it. Now I've drawn myself a little coordinate system, okay? And where I'm placing the coordinate system is right here. So the y-axis goes like this, what about the x-axis? And, and more specifically, what's going on with this hullabaloo down here? This looks like this weird blob here on the screen. I am assuming that if I take my samurai sword or lightsaber and I cut through the beam and I look at the beam it looks like this. And it's this amorphous blob because I'm, I'm trying to uh, indicate to you that it is an arbitrary cross-section. It could be an I-beam, a rectangle, a triangle, a, a circle. It, it doesn't matter, right? Just some arbitrary cross-section. Um, so I, the point I'm making is that whatever it looks like doesn't really matter for the purposes of the derivation, other than the location of this coordinate system. If I'm placing the coordinate system in such a fashion that the y-axis goes through this left support, but the x-axis goes through the cross-section at a very particular point, specifically where the centroid is, okay? So what's going on is along this line, y equals zero, and that's where the centroid is. Everybody with me so far? So for example, if it was a rectangular beam, so for example, if, if the beam right here was a rectangle, then that dashed line would be going through the centroid. Right? If it was, let's say, a triangle, then it would be going, you know, through that point right there where that's h over 3. With me so far? Okay. Now, I have two unknown forces inside the system that are generating normal stresses, an axial force and a bending moment. So, two unknowns. I need a stress profile that can capture those two unknowns, a stress profile that has two arbitrary constants. And so what I'm going to do for this derivation is I'm going to assume what I think the stress distribution is going to look like. And I'm going to assume, based off all those assumptions I made earlier, that the stress distribution is going to be linear. Okay? So the equation of a line is what? Y equals mx plus b, right? So 
This equation, y equals mx plus b, is basically that. Like this is the c2 is the slope of the line, c1 is the intercept, and instead of being like slope times x plus the intercept, it's slope times y uh, uh, plus the intercept because I'm going up and down instead of left to right. Okay. So I'm and, and by the way, I'm using c1 and c2 instead of like mx plus b, m and b, because m and b have meanings for us, and I don't want to confuse them. Like b, we take as like the width of the beam, right? And m, I don't want that to be confused with moment in general, so that's why I'm using just C1 and C2. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, stop me if you've got any questions. If, 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 you know, I'm not going to make you repeat this derivation on an exam or anything, but I do want you to kind of generally understand what's going on. So we've got this function that seems to make sense. We've got the equation of a line. It's just written in terms of y in terms of x. But I propose that my stresses look, look like this. But how do we get these two unknown constants? Well, we know the beam is subjected to two known loads. We know it's subjected to an axial force and a bending moment. So we're dealing with two equations, two unknowns, right? That's another reason I like this derivation. I know it's been a while since you've done a two equations, two unknowns problem, but I know that everybody in this room is very familiar with how to do that because we have done that multiple times last semester. We've even probably done it a couple of times this semester. So with me so far? So what I need to do, essentially, is I need to express this P and M in terms of this stress. And if I do that, do a little bit of plugging and chugging, and I'm there. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to look at a little slice of this beam, and I propose that the axial force inside the beam is the stress times the area, right? Stress times area is going to equal the force. And if I take stress times area, that gives me the force. Multiply it by a moment arm, that gives me the moment. Does that make sense? Okay, so I've got the force in some little bitty element, the moment in some little bitty element. Now I'm going to integrate. So how do I integrate? Well, what is sigma? Sigma is... What did we say? Sigma was C1 plus C2y, right? So the way that I'm going to do this is let's say we look at dp. dp is sigma dA. Well, that's going to equal C1 plus C2y dA, right? And if I want the axial force, I'm just going to integrate that. Right? And so what I can do is, remember how the integral of a sum is the sum of an integral, right? And we can pull constants out. What I can do is I can say, all right, C1 times the integral of, D, of dA plus C2, the integral of y dA. Kind of like with me so far how I'm doing this? So that's what I'm doing here in this next slide. So what I'm doing here in this next slide is I'm saying, okay, if I want dp, I'm going to substitute this sigma in for this. And then just integrate, split it up a little bit. Same thing with the moment. Plug in the sigma, factor it out, split it up a little bit. Okay, so I know there's a lot going on on this slide, but that's really all I'm doing. It's nothing very complicated. Okay, now, now I've got this. What the heck am I going to do with it? I've got these two integral expressions. Well, is there anything in those parentheses that look familiar? Right? What is the integral of dA. We've seen that before. That's the area, right? What about this? What about the integral of y squared dA? That's the moment of inertia, right? We've already seen that, right? So what we can do is we can plug and chug this right here, plug and chug this right here. But what about these two? What about the integral of y dA? Well, the integral of y dA is what's used to find the centroid, right? But do you remember where we place the coordinate system? We place the coordinate system such that the axis went right through the centroid. So this integral has got to be zero. So what do I do? I go back to my equations. I say, here's the P one. This is A. This is zero. This is zero. This is IX. Now I got something pretty simple here, something pretty simple here. 
Call for my unknown constants. Boom. Done. Take those unknown constants, plug them back into the expression, and I get this. So let's take a second and digest this. So I propose that under axial load and bending moment, the stresses are computed as, as, uh, as follows. The total stress equals P over A plus MY over I. P, o, P over A is the stress due to P. We already knew that. We knew that the stress due to an axial load was computed as P over A. What, what's new is the stress due to a bending moment is MY over I. Okay? Let me take a step back and see if that makes sense, if anybody has any questions on that. Is that good? Okay. All right. The derivation part is over. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. You made it through the calculus. Okay. I'm just kidding. All right, so that was essentially the understanding and the background behind why the equation is what it is. Now I want to talk about using it, okay? So let's talk about using the expression. So our third fundamental stress formula is sigma equals my over i. So in order to utilize this formula, what we need are essentially three components. We need the bending moment, Okay, the bending moment comes from the moment diagram. It's it, it, so to be clear, it could be given to us in a problem statement, or I'm given a structure and I need to analyze the structure in order to um, determine its uh, uh, bending moment. The uh, mechanical engineering student chapter has decided to build a pumpkin chunkin catapult, and there is an arm in that catapult that's going to fling pumpkins across the parking lot behind Third Avenue. So you say, okay, here's this arm in the, uh, in the catapult. The pumpkin weighs this much. What I learned in Engineering 214 tells me the forces are going to be this much when I fling the, um, fling the, the, the pumpkin across the, the, the parking lot. So now I've got this arm in the catapult and I've got these flexural forces. I draw the shear and bending moment diagram. Boom. Maximum bending moment. There, there's my M. Based on the properties of that uh, uh, arm in that pumpkin chunk and catapult. I know what the centroid is. I know what the moment of inertia is and so on and so forth. I can compute stresses using sigma equals m y over i. So m is our bending moment. i is our moment of inertia. What about y? y is the distance from the centroid to the point in question. So under flexure, there are zero bending stresses at the centroid. As you get further away from the centroid, the stresses increase. So you're going to get compression or compressive stresses on one side of the beam. In this case, let's say the uh, stresses above the neutral axis are in compression. Below the neutral axis, they're in tension. Okay. Now, which side experiences compression or tension depends on the applied load. So if we're in smiley face bending, if the beam is smiling at us, then the top is experiencing compression. If we're frowning, then the top is experiencing tension. Okay? With me so far? Okay. So I propose that this image here on the right illustrates what the bending stress profile looks like. Okay? And we've seen bending stress profiles before. When we looked at torsion, we said here's a circular cross section, there's the center, and the torsional stress profile looked like that, right? Maximum tor. Uh, Maximum stress in the ends, which was TR over J. With me so far? So zero torsional stress at the center, maximum torsional stress on the surface. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Where are the maximum bending stresses? Right? Either at the very, very tippy, 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 tippy top of the beam, or the way, way, very, very bottom of the beam, right? Depends on where the centroid is and 
and, and where the, the bending is occurring, okay? Now, in engineering speak, we do not call that the tippy, tippy, tippy top or the, you know, way, way, way bottom. We have a name for that. We call those extreme fibers, okay? So extreme fiber bending stress is the stress at either the top or the bottom, okay? Um, a lot of times in engineering notation land, what we will do is we will say that sigma max, we'll call sigma max mc over i. And c is what we call our extreme fiber distance, the distance from the centroid either to the very top of the beam or the very bottom of the beam. So under flexor, it is possible that you have different magnitudes of bending stresses. You have a maximum bending stress at the top and a maximum bending stress at the bottom, okay? And to be clear, sometimes it is very critical that you understand both. And some of you might be thinking, shouldn't you just care about the maximum? Not necessarily. I'll give you a very clear example why both matter. Reinforced concrete design. Concrete is a material, and this is true of ceramics in general. So for you mechanical engineers who are tuning out about concrete, if you don't think you use ceramics in mechanical engineering, you got another thing coming, as Judas Priest used to say. Um, whenever you're dealing with a ceramic type material, you have a, a, a material that behaves very, very well in compression, but very poorly in tension. Since I know concrete, one of the things I can tell you is concrete is about 10 times strong in compression than it is in tension. That's why you place rebar in concrete. That's the whole point, is to try and arrest tensile cracks. Now, so if I'm analyzing a concrete beam, I need to understand both the compressive stresses and the tensile stresses. I need to understand both of them. So I have to compute both, okay? With me so far? Now, if I know where the centroid is, I can very easily compute this maybe C top and C bottom. And I propose that I'm lazy, I'm an engineer and I'm lazy, that instead of dealing with MC over I, maybe what I'll do off to the side is compute this term I over C. And instead of dealing with MC over I, I'll just do M over this term I over C. And this term I over C has a name. We call it a section modulus, okay? This term S is a section modulus. So if you go back, whoop, if you go to, oh, I don't have it in this slideshow. I have, oh, I have it in the notebook. Let me pull the notebook out. So if you go to our bending stresses and whatnot, if you go to our, our flexural properties for W shapes, I know everybody's seen this. What is, if we look at axis 1, 1, that's the moment of inertia. What is this? That's the section modulus, okay? And all the section modulus is, is the moment of inertia divided by that extreme fiber distance. And so it's a constant, and it's pretty easy to uh, compute and derive, okay? With me so far? Now, technically, the way that we should be thinking about this is that, that there technically is a section modulus for the top bending stresses, or a section, a section modulus to the top of the beam, and a section modulus to the bottom of the beam. But it is very common in engineering applications that we use symmetric uh, 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 cross-sections. For example, an I-beam, uh, a W16 by 100, is symmetric. So instead of having an S top and an S bottom, there's just an S value. So if there's just an S value, all we, can, all we have to do is compute that. So sigma equals my over i, we can use that, or we can just use m over s, okay? So we can determine our bending moment, determine our section modulus, m over s, that's our bending stress. So it's a little bit of a shortcut uh, in that, in that uh, computational structure. With me so far? Would you like to do some math to try and tie all this together? try and, you know, actually make some sense out of all this hullabaloo I've been talking about for the past 30 minutes? Let's do it. Oh, well, it, unfortunately, it, uh, the votes don't matter. We're still doing it. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have a beam with a triangular cross-section. I decided to mix it up a little bit. And I'll, let me back up a little bit. This problem actually comes from an FE review session I did recently on mechanics and materials. And I thought, dang, this is just such a good problem. Let's just do it in class. I normally didn't do this in deformables, but I just thought, damn, it's a good problem. Let's do it. So I have a beam with a triangular cross-section, uh, and it is subjected to 80 newtons per meter, and the beam is 10 meters long. 
And I want to know what is the maximum compressive and tensile stresses. But what's cool about this is that it's not a rectangle, it's a triangle. Now, in, in order to reduce the page flipping and whatnot, because I know every single person in here brought their mechanics and materials textbook with them, right? This is a favor to those of you that I know brought it. As soon as I say that, everybody's like, just look at their desks. Um, I decided to snip this out of Appendix C of your textbook. This is the um, uh, uh, section properties for a triangle. So, for example, like Y bar, we know Y bar is H over 3. Like, we should all be pretty familiar with that by now from our, our centroid discussion in statics. So, what we're going to do is we're going to determine the, the flexural stresses in this beam. And I really like this problem because it ties everything together that we've been doing for the past couple lectures. So let me go ahead and um, pull the notebook up. Hold on. I have it here. I'm going to give you a sec to copy all this down, then we'll get to it. So, because I'm a nice guy. One person in class got the Judas Priest reference. Nobody else. He got it. Okay. I guess I'm old. I guess that's what it is. So, I propose that we are going to have a vertical reaction on either side. Oh, goodness, what happened there? Okay. Let me ask you this. Um, one way of computing those support reactions would be to, okay, I need to sum moment to the left support, turn that distributed load into a point load, 
right, and, get, and, and check that out. But is there any property that this beam exhibits that we might be able to exploit and make our lives a little easier? It's symmetry. It's symmetric, right? This beam ex ha, uh, exhibits symmetry. So what does that mean? It's symmetric. What does that mean about the reactions? They're equal, right? So what's the total amount of load on the beam? 800 newtons. 800 newtons. So watch this. So by symmetry, That's how you determine the total amount of load on the beam. There's the reaction. Half goes on one side, half goes on the other. Is that fair? Okay. So. Let's construct our shear diagram. Let's construct our moment diagram. This touch screen's rather touchy today. That wasn't a pun, it was, but it kind of it kind of came out to, to me. All right. So we start out at zero. D. First thing, everybody's got the giggles today. That's okay. Alright, so we start off with the jump up of 400 newtons. Now what happens from here to here? What's the shear diagram look like? It goes, it goes down. So if I'm at 400, what am I going to end up at right here? Negative 400. So shear diagram is going to drop down, something about like this. to negative 400, I'm going to pop back up to zero. And notice if the shear diagram or if the, the loads or the boundary conditions were more involved, we can handle that. I mean, we just did that on the last homework assignment and in the last few examples, but the process is no different, right? Now, somebody tell me what I need to do. How? Wait, hold on. How am I going to get the values for the moment diagram? And a gray. There you go. I need to determine the areas under these triangles. Now, in order to determine the areas under these triangles, I'm going to need this distance. What is this distance? There we go. Five meters. So. What's the area of this triangle? 400 times 5 over 2. 400 over 2 is 200. 200 times 5 is plus 1,000. Right? And I think that this is minus 1,000. So, what do we got? Zero. Lot to a little to positive a thousand. Little to a lot zero. So would you agree by observation? M max is a thousand newton meters, but if I want to get that into my preferred unit system of kilonewton millimeters, what do I do? Stoichiometry. Blasphemy in here. <laughs> How much, so what's the conversion rate between newton meters and kilonewton millimeters? 
It's one to one. Yeah, one newton meter is one kilonewton millimeters because you're multiplying one by three and you're dividing the other by three. They can't, or ten to the third. Sorry, ten to the third and ten to the third. So they cancel each other out. Before we move on, I mean, hopefully this should also just kind of like make sense from a gut feeling standpoint. Look, if I have this table and I spread out a bunch of load on this table, where is it going to flex the most? Right in the middle, right? That's what we found, right? So common sense also works in this arena too. So far so good? Okay. Now, so this is part of the equation, the bending moments. Now what we need are the section properties. So we were given a triangular cross-section. Let me draw that a little better. That's not a scale. And we were given that this was 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters. So I think like grade school geometry said that that is an isosceles triangle, right? I said we rarely get to use that word in a sentence, <laughs> you know? What's that? Watch the language. Watch the language. I didn't say stoichiometry. No. I, I didn't like that term. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Tolling, if you heard that. So. <laughs> Let's go back to the cross section. Cross section. Let's go back to this. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to deal. Let me, let me be clear about something. So, in section property land, I think it is much more advantageous to deal with your unit conversions before you do section property computations because you're dealing with like elements like raised to the fourth power, and I think it's just easier to deal with this now. So instead of 10 or sorry, 10 centimeters and 12 centimeters, I'm going to deal with 100 millimeters. 100 millimeters. 20 millimeters. I'm just going to deal with that now. Now, what is going to happen is we are going to get a very large number for our moment of inertia. That's okay. Okay. We're dealing with millimeters to the fourth, so it's going to get big. That's all right. Now, what's the moment of inertia of a triangle? I don't know about you. I can't remember. No need to. The person next to you is shaking their head no. no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just saying facts. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> I love my job. All right. Okay. So, whenever, you, listen, in, in all seriousness, I think there are some section properties that would do you well as an engineer to kind of just remember, but not. All of, you don't need to remember everything, okay? But let me be clear about the, what, what this is asking for. The, probably what a lot of people tend to just sort of gloss over is this, okay? You really need to understand what is going on right here, okay? B is the lateral width of the triangle, but H is the height of the triangle, the vertical height of the triangle. For this triangle, I propose that B is 120 millimeters, but H does not equal 100 millimeters. And I heard somebody say the magic number, and they're right, and I want to show you why. Okay? All right? 
This is a trick problem, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this triangle in half. Okay? If I cut this triangle in half, and I look at this sort of half triangle, which is a right triangle, because it's an isosceles triangle, I cut it in half, I get right. This is 100 millimeters. This is 60 millimeters. What is that? It's 80. And how do you get 80? Because this is a 3, 4, 5. I mean, if you want, you can use Pythagorean theorem or trig identity or trig function, whatever you want to use. But that height is 80. Okay? So in this case, the height. Eighty millimeters. Would it be so far? Now, I want you now to follow along with me because I want to rethink this cross section from a flexural standpoint. Let's look at this cross section in terms of flexure. Here's the cross section now. So. Here is the centroid. Okay. And if I draw a line out from the centroid, and I draw the bending stress profile, I'm going to get some, oh, why is it going out? I'm going to get something like this where this is the stress on the top, this is the stress on the bottom. Now, if this height is 80 millimeters, can somebody tell me what this distance is? Eight divided by three, which by the way, I'm gonna introduce a new notation. I'm going to call this C bottom. And this is C top. So now let's start doing some computations. So the moment of inertia, as we said, BH cubed over 36. And again, the reason why it's 36 and not 12 is because we're not looking at a rectangle. We're looking at a triangle. So BH cubed over 36 is 120 millimeters. 80 millimeters cubed over 36. And what does that equal?
a uh, like a, a singly symmetric I section or something like that. You're just gonna take the overall height minus that other centroid. And so I think it's like 53. Yeah, 53. Yeah, 33 millimeters. All right, does this make sense? Everybody with me so far? Okay, that's a great question. So where that came from is this right here. So whenever you look up the section properties for a triangular cross-section, or for any cross-section, it's going to give you all of them, not just a moment of inertia. And I propose that whenever you're pulling this up, this diagram is what matters. Let me drag this down a little further so I don't have to keep doing that. Okay. So here's the cross section, right? The coordinate system is placed along the centroid. So that's the neutral axis. I want this distance, which is referred to as y bar, and y bar is h over 3. So if the entire height is 80, that's 80 over 3. Don't hesitate to ask these types of questions. Guarantee you, other people in here have that question too. That's okay. This is tough stuff for 8 o'clock in the morning, I know. With me so far? So, so now, like that, here, I, I got, I got you. All right, is everybody able to read this too? If the handwriting's a little rough, let me know. Okay, so flexural stresses. So what do we know about our bending moment? Our bending moment was 1,000 kilonewton millimeters. This is millimeters to the fourth. And now we have a C top and a C bottom. C top was 53.33 millimeters. C bottom, 26.67 millimeters. So with all of this, what we can do is we can determine the stress at the top as 1,000 kilonewton millimeters times 53 0.33, all divided by this. Now, before we start doing any chugging, we're going to get a small number, but does anybody remember what the units of that number are going to be in? This is a stress. When you take a kilonewton over a millimeter squared, what do you get? You get a gigapascal. So this is going to be tiny but it's going to be in gigapascal, so we can multiply it by 1,000 in the end and get it in megapascal. So let's just go ahead and check this out and see what we get. Anybody got an answer for me? Because you didn't bring your Casio FX-115 as plus or similar scientific calculator, did you? Wow. Say it again. Point And then we'll say like 2.5? Yep. About like that. And that's in gigapascals. Or we'll call it 31.3 megapascals. Now, before we move on to the next one, I want to see if everybody's paying attention. Is this bending stress on the top, is it a compressive bending stress or a tensile bending stress? How do we determine that? 
let me ask you this. Under these loads, is the beam going to smile at us or is it going to frown at us? I'm serious. It's going to smile, right? And if the beam is smiling, the top is in compression. The bottom is pulling apart, is in tension. This is a compressive bending stress. And another way that you can determine that is if you look at your moment diagram and the moment is positive, the top's in compression. All right. What about this one? What do we got? Got a second on that? All right. And so multiplying by a thousand. That's going to be intention. Stop for a sec, and I want to see if anybody has any questions. We're not done. We got another problem we're going to look at, but I want to see if this makes sense. This isn't too tough, is it? Hopefully. Yes. It's just compression and tension is the difference that it's talking about, right? Yeah. Yes. If. So to be clear, if we were looking at our moment diagram and our moment diagram has nothing but positive values on it. It goes from like zero to a pos to positive thousand. If there were regions on our bending moment diagram that had negative moment and we were looking there, this could be flipped. The top would be in tension, the bottom would be in compression. Any questions? Sound good? Okay. Let's look at our next problem. This one's going to be a lot simpler. There's a lot less steps to it, but it's a little more real world. All right. So what would the resulting stresses be on the top and bottom of the following uh, uh, Cross sections if they were subjected to a bending moment of 10 foot kicks. Okay, now I want to be clear right off the bat, I want to do a unit conversion. And I want to say that I want to do that right off the bat. And the reason why. To be honest, I don't really care so much about the kips, but I care about the inches because all of our section properties are in inches, and I don't want to conflate the two. Pounds to kips is pretty easy, but feet to inches, I don't, don't want to mess with that right now. All right. What we're going to do is we are going to look at various cross sections to determine what their stresses are. Now, other than this very last one, the others are going to exhibit symmetric bending, okay? What I mean by that is, unlike the triangle, we are going to experience the same magnitude of stresses at the top or the bottom. See, with the triangle, why did we get different stresses on the top versus the bottom? Because what? it's orientation. But, well, let me, let me, you're right, but let me give you another way of stating the exact same thing. Because Y bar wasn't 40. Basically, right? Y bar wasn't 40. If Y bar was 40, then sigma equals M Y over I, we'd have the same C top and C bottom. They'd be the same, right? Well, remember that there is a shortcut to sigma max. A shortcut is we can say MC over I, or we can say 
m over s. And whenever I write, I tend to put little serifs on my s because my s's and my fives look the same. So I put the little tick marks on the end of my s's. But remember, s is i over c, which is our section module. So let's see what would happen if we change our orientations. So we're going to look at a W14 by 53, then about its strong axis, and then about its weak axis. So let's see. Here's our table. That's W14 by 53. We're looking at this value right here, this value right here. These are section moduli. Section moduli, like moments of inertia, are reflective of flexural stiffness. The bigger they are, the more stiff they are in resisting flexure. With me so far? So, the strong axis is going to be the orientation with the largest S value. In this case, 77.8, or the largest I value, if you want to think of it that way. So, our M, was it 100, was it 120? Or, yeah, 120. Therefore, what is sigma strong? Just 120 over 77.8. What is that? 1.54 KSI. 1.54 KSI. Or 15.40 PSI. Now, sigma weak. What's that going to be? And everybody brought the Casio FX 115 yes plus or so much not through the calculator. <laughs> oh, on, anybody got a value for me? should be a rather amazing finding to you. So to be clear, what that means is this, okay? We have our I section here, and we're bending it about this axis. So I've got the I beam flange and flange, and I'm bending it like that. This is strong axis bending. But if I take that I beam and turn it, this way, and bend it about this axis. This is the weak axis. And I get much more bending stress. Like under strong axis bending, the maximum bending stress are along this surface here and along this surface there. But under weak axis bending, the biggest stresses are on the tips of these flanges on either end. They're equal. Like one's compress, they're, they're equal in magnitude, it's just one's compression and one's tension. Does that make sense? Now, if you, now to be clear, um, what does this tell you as an engineer? Like if you were using these types of cross sections in a system, like what does that tell you? Like common sense. That's exactly right. In all seriousness, I would try and maintain strong axis bending as much as possible, right? I would try and eliminate weak axis bending. Now, 
In a lot of instances, that's true. So, for example, this floor system, right? The I being supporting it, just make sure they're facing this way, right? Don't face them that way, right? But what other components, for example, in buildings do we use these types of sections for? We also use them for the columns, right? What do you think hits the building this way? The wind. And the wind doesn't give a hoot which way the column's facing, right? It doesn't care, right? The wind might be blowing this way one day, it might be blowing this way the next, right? So you need to be able to handle both. So some instances, so the short answer is we try and eliminate it as much as possible, but that's not always possible, all right? It just is what it is. Yes, sir? So I was going to say, just like in structural components, I know in the marine environment, uh, there's almost we look for weak axis bending in impact resistance. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so I guess your elasticity of whatever material you're using and then in combination with weak axis bending, you can use that material almost as a uh, as a give or as a buffer when the impact against water or, or whatever it may be. That's a fair point. I'll give you another instance where weak axis behavior matters, and that's in the land of buckling, which is what we're going to talk about here at the end of the semester. When you load a column, assuming that the boundary conditions are the same along both axes, the column does not care which way you will face it. It's going to buckle the way it's going to buckle, and it typically buckles under weak axis suspension. Make sense? Okay. One real quick add an uh, addendum to this, and then we're going to call it, okay? Because uh, I know you all have dynamics to get to. C15 by 50. So we're going to take the C15 by 50, we're going to bend it about its strong axis, and we're going to bend it about its weak axis. Okay. okay. So we're talking about This section right here, okay, and I think I violated my, my rule as I didn't include the image, the little schematic here, but we'll, we'll make do. So we're talking about this value and this value, but there's something up with that second axis, that axis 2, 2, because notice how they gave us this. Why did they give us that over here but not axis 1, 1? And moreover, if you look at the I-beams, there is no C value for the axis 2, 2. Why do we have a C value over here? Why? Well, this is a channel that's strong axis bending. Is the section symmetric about that blue line? About the blue line? Yes. Now, what if I turn it? and I bend it about this axis. Is it symmetric? No. What that means is, under weak axis bending, I'm not going to be able to directly use M over S. What's going to happen is I'm going to get different bending stresses along the top than I am along the bottom. Okay. Now, let me, for the sake of discussion, do a little bit of reproduction. But in the meantime, we can go ahead and determine our major axis bending stress. We know what that's going to be. That's going to be easy. So don't forget M120 inch dips. We know that S strong is 53.8. So what's that going to be? Two point two three KSI. Two point two three KSI. Second. For the weak axis, this is what I'm going to do because I think it's easier to follow. Okay, What we are told 
in the textbook, and you can follow this along on, on the, it's what, page 1094 in the textbook, is for the weak axis, here's what we've got. And I'm sort of like crouching my arm down here, so bear with me. So we know that the moment of inertia is this value right here, which is 11, sorry, 11.0 uh, inches to the fourth. And we've also been given this C value, which is 7 or 0.799 inches. Now, what the textbook tells us in terms of that C value is the following, that if here's your channel, and here's your centroid right there, that C is this distance. This is C. So if I'm turning this that way, I know this distance, but how do I find that distance? I'm asking you. So if I know this distance is C, how do I find this distance? Let me ask you this. What is that? Somebody said it. I heard it. I think that's that value right there, the width of the flange. Remember, this is a channel, right? These are the flanges. That's the web, right? So the width of the flange is... 3.72, I'll call that BF. So if I'm looking at this type of bending, and this is our axis of bending, goodness gracious, the touch screen. This dimension right here is 0 0.799 inches. This dimension right here is 3.72 minus 0 0.799 inches. So therefore, sigma on the top is mc over i. And sigma on the bottom is M over I, and instead of C, we'll say BF minus C. Does that make sense? And the reason we're having to get funky with this one, bending about the weak axis, is because it's not symmetric. The others were, so we could use the M over I and whatnot, or M over, sorry, M over S. But with this one, I think it's kind of just easier to ensure that you're going to get it right by doing MC over I. I don't, uh, somebody else says their Casio FX 115S plus, so they can tell me what the values are. But I know what sigma top is. Say it again. 8.716 KSI. So we'll say 8.72. And this one. And one of the reasons that the stresses got just higher is because the section just got smaller. Smaller beam, bigger stresses. Yes, sir. What? It's supposed to be a sigma. No, you didn't have to just like point out like horrible handwriting. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's supposed to be a sigma. I mean, this is not even the same shape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's make sure that that that, <laughs> that passed the smell test. Oh, remember that, sir. I'm sorry. I, I just thought it was an R, and I'm like, wait, an R? All right, everybody. That's all I got. I will see you all on Thursday.